So for a number of years, it's not the case anymore. Vancomycin was the antibiotic of last resort. Uh, what that meant is they only used it if everything else had failed, and they only would use it in a hospital setting. Have any of you had vancomycin? Somebody had last year. It's pretty unusual. Probably one in a thousand have had it. It means you had a very resistant bacterial infection and they thought you were going to die, basically. Um, it's injected as a drug and it's a super powerful antibiotic. It has quite a lot of unpleasant side effects associated with it, but it's pretty good. And the point of having an antibiotic of last resort is that bacteria don't meet it very often. So in the wider population of bacteria, there's not a lot of resistance to the drug because there's not been much chance to evolve the resistance. So that's the plan of having an antibiotic of last resort. So vancomycin was originally found in, in soil in Japan. You'll find that lots of antibiotics are found in quite nasty environments. Soils, dirts, sewage farms, places where there's lots of bacteria and natural organisms are having to fight the bacteria and you extract the natural organisms and you find they're pumping out all these chemicals to try and kill the bacteria around them. So it's quite a way you can go look for these things is go look in your local sewage farm and see if you can find the next antibiotic, right? Um, and it's quite a complex structure to this molecule. So vancomycin is all this top part of the molecule. It's the big part, okay? And don't worry, I don't expect you to learn the structures of drugs in this course. That would be ridiculous. We're learning principles about how drugs work. I might expect you to recognise drugs. If I showed you the structure of a penicillin in an exam question, I'd expect you to recognise it's a beta-lactam <coughs> and to be able to comment on why it's an antibiotic. But I don't expect you to memorise the structures of drugs. I do expect you to know about their modes of actions and why and how they work. And that's what we're going to focus on with vancomycin. So vancomycin is a really interesting drug, mechanistically. Vancomycin also targets lice de hour de hour. So it's involved in exactly the same bit of bacterial cell wall mechanism. I'll just re-emphasize, of the bacterial cell wall. But unlike penicillin, it does not mimic it. Instead, it binds to it. So it binds this really key component of the bacterial cell wall. So, I'll break this structure down, put the ring around that. So that is the vancomycin. For clarity. And what I've shown here in the grey is lice. Ala, ala. Alanine has a methyl side chain, lysine has a long chain with an amine on the end. So that's the lyse, ala, ala. And if this was a bacterial cell wall, this would then be the glycopeptide chain coming out here. And the vancomycin is a macrocyclic compound and it's got a kind of claw like structure. You can't really see it in the way it's drawn here. Obviously, flat representations of complex molecules are limited. So it's claw-like. And most importantly, it uses five hydrogen bonds to bind to the lice diala diala. There's an NH that binds to a carbonyl a carbonyl that binds to an NH, an NH that binds to a carbonyl, and an H that binds to a carbonyl, and an NH that binds to the carboxylate oxygen. Five key hydrogen bonds. So if you bind 
to this key bit of the cell wall, what that does is it stops the transpeptidase enzyme getting in there to do the cross-linking, right? So unlike penicillin that was binding to transpeptidase to stop it doing its work, vancomycin is binding to the cell wall so that transpeptidase can't come in and do its work. So it's exactly the same bit of cell wall mechanism, but just the opposite side that's being inhibited. So, binding to lice, diala diala, stops it interacting with transpeptidase. And that stops cross-linking, and that kills the bacteria. This time, the interaction is through five hydrogen bonds. That's a reversible binding event, okay? So that is referred to as reversible inhibition. There are not any covalent bonds this time. Whereas penicillin was covalently getting bound to transpeptidase. You might be tempted to think that reversible inhibition is somehow not as good as irreversible inhibition, because it's reversible. It's, it's just language. It tempts you into thinking, this can't be as good then because it's reversible whereas penicillin is irreversible. Don't get tempted by the language, it's rubbish. Vancomycin is a much, much better drug than penicillin. Um, it works much more effectively. The reversibility is kind of irrelevant, it's a strong interaction, and it's a big molecule, and it really stops the transpeptidase getting involved. And so, whether it's reversible or irreversible doesn't matter as to how good it is, it's simply a description of the mechanism by which it's working. And in fact, most drugs that you would use or meet in medicinal chemistry, most drugs are reversible binders. So this is more of a normal situation. So most drugs do bind reversibly. So that's great, right? You've got this antibiotic of last resort. It's got a different mode of action. Um, so you can treat resistant bacteria. You inject it into patients. Uh, we'll explain why in a later lecture, why this has to be injected, why it's not orally active. Uh, that links to some key principles of medicinal chemistry. But the problem is bacteria can become resistant to vancomycin. For a long time, it was used as an antibiotic of last resort, and the medics were pretty confident. They were like, we're fine, we've got this, it'll, you know, because we hardly ever use it, it'll mop up all those difficult cases. They figured that because they were using it in a healthcare setting, that they had quite good control over how it was being used, so resistance wouldn't become a problem. In reality, resistance does become a problem. Lots of resistant bacterial infection strains actually emerge in hospitals originally, because that's where most of the antibiotics are used. And vancomycin-resistant enterococci are one of those. So enterococci develop resistance to this. And they do it in a really simple way. They don't evolve an enzyme to break it down or anything like that. They make their cell wall differently. What they do is they replace diala diala. with diala, lac. You may be wondering what lac is because it's not an amino acid, right? It's a lactate. <coughs> and it's a really beautiful example. I mean, it's kind of horrific, of course, because vancomycin resistant bacteria are really quite problematic, but it's a really beautiful example of how a single atom change can introduce resistance. So let's look again at our picture of vancomycin binding to this cell wall mimetic. And let's focus on this bit here, right? 
this X. Now, if we have alanine, this is a NH. It's an amino acid, so we get a peptide linkage. If we have LAC, it's not an NH, it's an oxygen. Because we have an alcohol lactate, has an alcohol group here, and it makes an ester linkage instead. It's not quite as good at making a cell membrane, but it's functional for the bacterium to make its cell membrane with lactate at the terminal position. And it's something that it has within its <coughs> metabolic ability to do. And that tiny number of bacteria, it only needs one in a billion that did it by mistake, survive, reproduce, 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 and become dominant. And that's how the resistance emerges. Things only have to be a one in a billion, one in a trillion chance for resistance to evolve. So even if they seem unlikely, like replacing an amino acid with a lactate, that's another metabolic component, if it can happen, then it can. And why does that introduce resistance? Well, think about this interaction between X and the oxygen. If you have an NH here, as we did here, you have a nice productive hydrogen bond. They are actually much closer than that. You just can't draw them close together and see what's going on. Yeah? So it's a good hydrogen bond. But if you put an oxygen here, there's no hydrogen bond with that oxygen. And in fact, there's a repulsion between the oxygen and this oxygen. So now, by making the cell wall differently, you have four hydrogen bonds and one repulsion. Oxygen to oxygen. They're both electron rich. This significantly weakens binding by two or three orders of magnitude. And what that means is the vancomycin can't bind to dialadilac. So vancomycin cannot bind dialadilac. And if the vancomycin can't bind, the bacteria can cross-link the cell wall. And they can survive, and they're resistant. And as I said, if you want to read more, you can always go and find out about vancomycin-resistant uh, enterococci. Now, it's really interesting, because once we have that chemical understanding of what's going on, we can begin to understand how we might change that. So if the whole problem is because the bacterium has put an oxygen in this position, then as chemists, we know that it's this bit of vancomycin that's problematic. If we replace this oxygen with something else, maybe it was a NH, then we'd switch an interaction back on with the modified bacterium. Maybe if we move, remove the oxygen altogether, we'd get rid of the repulsion and it would bind strongly enough. Now, obviously, vancomycin is a big and complex molecule, so it's difficult to just tinker at one position because chemists don't really work like that. You build molecules up step by step. But that's exactly what Boga has recently done in his labs. So he synthesized a modified version of vancomycin in which the oxygen atom which repels the oxygen of DLAC was replaced with a CH2 group. Now, that was a remarkable piece of chemistry. He went and built it up step by step. It was a 36-step synthesis. So it's never going to be a medicine because it would be too expensive to make, right? But he showed that it was active against vancomycin-resistant enterococci with the Diala-Dilac modification. So it shows that a single functional group in a really complex drug can play a vital role in enabling activity. And Boga then went on in 2013 to file a US patent and in the patent he used fermentation 
to make the vancomycin, because again, it is a natural product drug. You're not going to synthesize something like that from scratch and use it as a medicine, way too expensive. So it is a fermented product. He modified the fermentation and he showed that carbon double bond oxygen in the modified ferment in the relevant position was an imine type group, a carbon double bond NH on the vancomycin. <coughs> And this switches on the attraction. And again, it defeats the vancomycin resistant enterococci. And that does look medicinally useful because it's just a modified fermentation. Vancomycin is made by fermentation anyway. You modify the fermentation, you get the modified vancomycin, then what you need to do is put it through proper clinical trials. Of course, when I say it defeated the vancomycin-resistant enterococci, I mean in a Petri dish. It's not been used in a patient yet. But I suspect that in five, ten years' time, we'll be teaching this as a way that vancomycin was evolved within patients so that there was a second generation of vancomycin in the same way that I was showing you adding clavulanic acid improves the performance of penicillins. But you're always fighting a kind of losing battle because ultimately the bacteria will evolve some way of getting around this. And this is a massive problem with all chemical treatment of all infectious agents, actually. right? Um, and that's why we have to think very carefully about how we use these drugs uh, and when we use these drugs and also whether ultimately it is the right strategy in the long term. It's worked for 100 years. It's certainly got 100, 200 years more in it using small molecule drugs as antibiotics. Does it have a 1,000 years in it? I don't know. Will something else come along, phage treatment that's more biological to replace antibiotics? I don't know. So, and these are open debates in antibacterial therapies at the moment. <coughs>